So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Todd Wynn, who's going to provide our uh, our lecture this morning. Todd is uh, special to me, special to this program. He was our first fellow in this program uh, many moons ago. It's been a long time it's, already. It's been a while, and we're just been delighted how he has uh, established himself and brought credit to our community as well as this program by uh, establishing himself as just uh, one, one of the uh, preeminent leaders in hospice and palliative medicine in West Michigan. So. Um, it's fun to bring him back uh, and uh, and share with us. So, um, Todd, I'll give you a chance to go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's good to see everybody around the table, and it's also uh, good to, to have everybody who's joining us online. So, so welcome. Uh, the lecture topic for today is the treatment of nausea and vomiting. Uh, my intent on this lecture today is to really give a fairly global uh, view of it to understand some of the uh, the pathophysiology of it, the, the mechanisms of, of nausea and vomiting, and then to really start to try to um, talk about the treatment options that are for nausea and vomiting. It's it's possible that one could actually put together a, a lecture on nausea and vomiting that would focus on a few more uh, discrete treatment options and, and actually spend a lot of time on that. But today's going to be more of a, an attempt to, to have a global or a larger view of it. Our objectives for today are be able to identify the mechanisms involved in nausea, the various triggers that can induce nausea and vomiting. We also want to identify the various treatments and the remedies for nausea, as well as the indications for that use. So on to some quotations, just that this was a fun quote that I thought that just recognizes how you really lose all your pride and affectation, whatever your status is, when you're when you're uh, nauseated and vomiting, all of that kind of goes out the window, so to speak. Uh, let's see. Uh, the act of vomiting deserves your respect. It's an orchestral event of the gut. Uh, that's a, a very um, uh, a somewhat poetic uh, way of talking about it, but there really is a, just the complexities of, of the act of vomiting that is, is truly uh, akin to somewhat of an orchestra. And then uh, from Rodney Dangerfield, I went to see my doctor, Dr. Vitabumba. I told him once, doctor, every morning when I get up and look in the mirror, I feel like throwing up. What's wrong with me? He says, I don't know, but your eyesight is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Rodney. Um, vomiting with the ancients, of course. Uh, we have the uh, the history with with uh, vomitoriums where vomiting was induced to try to help uh, maintain weight and, uh, and help to became, make more room for continued binge eating. Um, which way to the vomitorium? Uh, could have been a, a reasonable uh, billboard at that time. Vomiting in politics. This is our uh, former president, George Bush, at a conference. And again, this kind of brings up how it's impossible to have uh, put on airs and uh, have a whole lot of uh, of uh, snobbery or prestige when you're in front of the Japanese prime minister and still throwing up and your wife is holding a, a rag over you. Uh, so uh, just kind of a humbling experience, I think. Uh, vomiting in sports. Uh, so we're going to see here, uh, I think this is Pete Sampras. After a particularly grueling match, uh, just uh, again, uh, some of the different uh, contributors to nausea and vomiting, and this would be the uh, contribution of, uh, of overexertion. And then vomiting in pop, pop culture. Here's Lady Gaga and, uh, and I believe a fan, and they were uh, doing some sort of a, a weird uh, gyration up on stage, and who knows all the different factors that were involved in this, but both of them started vomiting on each other. And... Uh, Boy, uh, would have uh, glad I wasn't at that concert. I'd, so I don't see Taylor Swift necessarily doing this, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so and then of course vomiting in October. So we are here in the month of October. We've got our pumpkins out and parties and too much candy, and in this case maybe these jack o' lanterns had too much uh, alcohol and uh, this kind of thing. So. Um, and actually, as we start with this lecture, I'm going, to, I'm going to touch on some different things like historical remedies and go through the different treatment uh, options. But I also just wanted to recognize that uh, I'm uh, I'm one of voice among many, and many of you, uh, both around the table and uh, and uh, participating online, have your own experiences and your own uh, opinions and your own uh, um, uh, history with these things. So. Uh, I am very open to hearing if you have uh, something that I say that you disagree with, or if you have something that you could say that can augment uh, what I'm talking about, uh, I would invite you to participate as much as possible. So some of the historical remedies for nausea and vomiting, uh, bloodletting, 
uh, is an old one. Uh, we certainly don't do that anymore, but ginger and mint are, uh, are both things that we still uh, can talk to our patients about, uh, sometimes whether that's an aromatherapy or even just a, a little gentle taste, um, this kind of a thing. And then uh, frankincense uh, is a historical remedy for nausea and vomiting. And um, I'm not even sure where I would buy frankincense if I were going to try to use that these days. Not but, a uh, yeah. Or myrrh, frankincense or myrrh. I've never had any idea where to get those things. Uh, this was from uh, Dr. Alice Emery, uh, one of our, I don't know if she's on today, but a uh, longtime palliative care physician here in the community. What's the best food to eat when you're vomiting? Bananas, because they taste the best when they are coming back up. Yum. Yum. <laughs> so uh, we'll, uh, we'll do a few case studies uh, today to just help to crystallize some of the different uh, options that we have out there. Uh, so in this particular case, this is an 84-year-old woman diagnosed with ovarian cancer three years ago, has had uh, surgical resection, has had chemotherapy, has diffuse peritoneal metastases, uh, contributing to a partial bowel obstruction. This was a, a real patient many, many years ago. And uh, in this case, her chief issues have been this nausea, vomiting, uh, oh, and, uh, uh, some dysphagia, as well as gastroesophageal reflux disease. And, and, and part of the challenge with her was actually trying to distinguish what was heartburn and what was nausea. And uh, so we were having some of that, and we're doing a little advancement here without necessarily trying to. The other part of this was she wanted to keep eating. We're, we're going to touch on that part a little bit uh, more as we come across, because uh, it's going to talk about how do, how do patients' goals dovetail with their prognosis, and how do we then uh, try to meet goals or help to uh, help to change uh, goals and to, to really talk about what appropriate expectations can be. But in this case, she was very clear, if at all possible, she wanted to keep eating. And this is not unusual with our patients. It's a strong emotional component to our living, and, uh, and this is something that we do see. The etiology of nausea. Uh, so uh, in general, when we're talking about how this is this orchestra is is put forth. There is the uh, chemoreceptor trigger zone, which is located in the brain and is impacted in different ways uh, by other things as well. So we have input coming from the GI tract and we have input coming from the vestibular apparatus, the inner ear. And all of this then can combine to get to the, the vomiting. Um, I'm missing this on my... Oh, where we are. Hang on a second. I can, I can minimize that. Great. Good. Nobody else can see that. Okay. That's... Yeah, so the vomiting center in the medulla, uh, which is really where all of the, 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 the vomiting then is actually, that's the final pathway there is that vomiting center of the medulla. So these, these three main centers that contribute to that, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, the GI tract, the vestibular uh, apparatus, um, and, the, and then the the cortex to, to produce the, the vomiting and nausea. Down at the bottom of that particular image, you'll see some potentially beneficial drugs. We'll talk about this a little bit more later, but for the chemoreceptor trigger zone, drugs that typically impact this are your uh, drugs that affect dopamine and the 5-HT3 serotonin receptors. For the vestibular pathway, and this will come as a surprise to nobody who's had problems with motion sickness in the past, these are where your anticholinergics, the anti-muscarinics, can really be of some value. In the uh, vomiting center, uh, again, uh, 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 antihistamines and cholinergics. And then for gastric stasis from the GI tract, this is where we run into the 5-HT4 serotonin receptors. And again, some dopamine receptors are there. We'll come back to that here in a little bit. But the, 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 the main point I want to put here is that nausea has different causes. And if we can, in our, our assessment, start to narrow down what those causes are, that can start to have some meaningful impact in what our choices are for use of antiemetics, just in the same way that we do with pain or with other things. So an assessment is going to be key here. And I'm frozen up here, John. You're not moving. Do it that way too. Yep. 
Okay, so some of the things that we want to do in our assessment is talk about when was when was the onset of the nausea and vomiting? What is the frequency? Talk about the relationship to eating. Talk about the relationship to medications. Uh, what are their current antiemetics that they're using? We can talk about whether or not this is chronic versus acute versus progressing. Talk about alleviating factors. It's uh, it's reasonable to, to try to put this on the severity scale in the same way that we do with pain. Uh, how bad is your nausea? Is a scale of zero to 10. Um, and then again, to come come back to, and this is just so common in, in the world of palliative medicine, is what are your goals? And of course, goals need to be managed in the setting of what is your prognosis, what is your trajectory? So very important to, to, to do a good, clear assessment of patients. And then to identify what are some of the reversible causes. So before we start uh, hitting them with Zofran, uh, we can talk about, well, what are the things that we can maybe remove that have been contributing to their situation? So of course, chemotherapy, opiates. We've got a lot of patients on opiates. Certain antibiotics can be implicated in nausea. NSAIDs can uh, impact uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, which can cause nausea. And then uh, even some of the antidepressants that are out there. Constipation. This is one that uh, we always need to be thinking about. Again, our, our patients may have challenges with constipation due to opiate use. They may have constipation due to their, their underlying disease process. They may have gastroparesis or slow bowel, uh, mo uh, bowel motility. Gastroesophageal reflux we talked about. Uremia uh, is one I, I often don't think about, but, uh, but we can definitely want to keep that on the list. Other infections. All of these can be reversible causes, which if we can relieve somebody's constipation rather than putting them on a different uh, anti-emetic, that's a, that's a better choice all around. Pain is another uh, source of nausea for patients. Dehydration. Uh, for those of you who are pediatricians around this table, I know we've got at least a couple of them. Um, I, I was always impressed in the emergency department with how how giving IV fluids to a kid who is experiencing a severe GI bug and having a lot of nausea, just the act of rehydrating them, they could be running around the emergency department afterwards and, and feeling good. And that applies to adults too, although we don't usually run around as quickly, do we, John? Uh, I haven't done a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, electrolyte imbalances, so things like hyper uh, hypercalcemia uh, can be implicated into it. Um, endocrine dysfunction and then increased intracranial pressure, of course. Uh, you know, you can throw Zofran at a, a patient with increased intracranial pressure and you're not going to give them a lot of benefit. You're going to need to look at other things and maybe maybe steroids are going to be part of that. And then uh, finally, uh, anxiety and the impact of anxiety in our experience of nausea, just like in our experience of pain and probably in our experience of life in general, uh, can really change what our, what our experience is like. And so to be aware of that, to be aware of how prevalent it is. And uh, that does not necessarily mean, again, that we throw Ativan or, or Valium or Xanax at everything. Um, sometimes just being able to sit in the room and talk with the patient about it does a, goes a long way to starting to relieve some anxiety. But, but to be aware of the large impact that that has in patients with their symptom experience. Other causes can include things like pregnancy. Uh, cyclic vomiting syndrome, which still feels like a new disease to me or a new syndrome, even though it's been around for a long time, but um, that's often associated these days with marijuana, uh, uh, high marijuana use. Uh, liver disease, very implicated in nausea, migraines, post-surgical, MIs. There are some people, uh, maybe, maybe more prevalent in women, where sometimes their presenting symptom of an MI is nausea and vomiting and paying attention to that. Violent coughing. Of course, uh, hangover and, uh, uh, and, and uh, things like Meniere's disease, all of these are, are other uh, contributors or causes of nausea. Here's a, here's a somewhat complex slide that, that uh, goes back in some ways to our, our previous slide that kind of uh, illustrated the orchestral uh, piece of this. So, you can see over on the right-hand side where the end result is nausea and vomiting. And just to the left of that is this vomiting center in the medulla of the brain. That really seems to be the, the key point where, where all of these other stimuli can, can enter in. So you can see uh, at the top of that, uh, just leading into that vomiting center, there's a part of this that goes to the cortex. So this refers to things like meningeal irritation, increased intracranial pressure, 
We can put anxiety and other sensory inputs into that as well, but this is where the cerebral cortex can impact that vomiting center directly. Um, then there are other areas, of course. Uh, so the vestibular system, we talked about that being the inner ear, the, the, the labyrinthine disorders that can contribute to, to um, uh, vestibular uh, irritation. And then that's complicated. That one can lead directly to the vomiting center or that can also stimulate the chemoreceptor trigger zone. So the CTZ is what uh, people in the low know like to call that area. That can be directly impacted again by drugs, by metabolic products, by bacterial toxins, and, and that kind of a thing. And then down at the bottom, we see these, uh, these peripheral pathways largely looking at the GI tract. So um, mechanical stretch. So this is where when you have a, an obstructive uh, disease going on, stretching of the, the colon um, of the viscera will contribute to um, nausea, vomiting, stasis is the other part of that, right? So constipation or, or gastroparesis, stasis will do it. Mucosal injury, such as metastatic disease, radiation therapy, um, and then local effects of toxins and drugs. So again, it's just, it's a slide I don't expect you to necessarily remember, but to come away with this understanding that there are in fact different pathways that lead to this end result of nausea and vomiting. And it's, it's good to be aware of them so that you can then start to finesse your, your therapeutic choices there. Anybody with any questions so far? Good stuff. Yeah. And then to recognize this, that as much as we try to say, okay, here's what's going on, here's what's causing their nausea and vomiting, most, uh, most of the time we're dealing with multifactorial issues. Uh, anxiety is often implicated as well as the chemotherapy drug, and there may be some, some other cortical uh, issues that are going on. So um, be aware that uh, oftentimes we're dealing with multifactorial causes. As always, we should start, we should talk about some non-pharmacologic treatments for this. And we already mentioned one of those is to remove some of the stimulating factors for patients, if at all possible. So reassurance and relaxation, I really think that that is a powerful one that we can do. And sometimes the act of simply sitting with patients and talking with them and even being able to just be calm and not distressed about their symptoms helps them to be also not as distressed. Um, correct. We can correct dehydration, correct those, some of those electrolyte disturbances. Decompress. We'll talk about that a little bit later on, but sometimes it's in the setting of a mechanical bowel obstruction or a malignant bowel obstruction, decompressing is maybe the main thing that you can do to really help manage patients. Correcting constipation is a part of that. Oral hygiene. You know, I have it on this slide and I, I give this lecture and and yet when I'm in with a patient, I seldom actually think about it. But many of our patients, especially if they've been inpatient for quite a period of time, they haven't brushed their teeth and uh, they haven't had a chance to really kind of get cleaned up in the act of cleaning their face, cleaning their hair and cleaning their mouth, uh, brushing their teeth and being able to get a good rinse of, uh, of, uh, of a mouthwash or something can go a long way towards helping making you feel better and helping with things like nausea. When it comes to eating, um, reducing the portions, eating smaller amounts. Cold food seems to be less noxious than than uh, hot food. Um, I have one lovely patient who's dealing with uh, progressive uh, breast cancer, and I see her in her home every once in a while. And the last time I was there, she's talking about her nausea. And as we're talking about her nausea, her adult daughter comes in and starts frying up bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, as, as, as much as I love the smell of bacon for my poor patient, uh, that was just like, oh my God, I can't, I can't do this. So uh, being aware of smells and, uh, and, and hot food and all of that uh, starts to, to be something to consider. Reducing or eliminating tube feedings. This is a big one in our patients. Um, some of them, as they have advanced disease, they'll have tube feedings that are happening. And uh, it's not uncommon for tube feedings to be contributors to nausea and vomiting. And so reducing or sometimes having that difficult conversation saying, hey, look, these tube feedings are doing more harm than good to you at this point. And maybe it's time that we stop. And that's uh, that has implications for their trajectory. And so patients are, uh, that can be an impactful discussion, but sometimes, again, something that's very meaningful and, and ultimately helpful for them. Avoiding odors, we talked a little bit about that already. And this is what you do not want your patients doing. <laughs> it's difficult for me to understand exactly what the point of this picture was. I kind of, in my mind, put it as uh, some sort of a 
a Russian study where they're just looking at the effects of deodorant, but I, I have no uh, real context for this photo. So apologies to any Russians who are listening. <laughs> <laughs> And then we're going to talk about so how to match the etiology with the mechanism. So remember the chemoreceptor trigger zone, the vestibular uh, pathway, the cortex, and then those GI and peripheral pathways you can match up here with the so your your dopaminergic and their five HT three antagonists are really most effective at the CTZ, antihistamines and antimuscarinics more at the vestibular area antihistamine and anxiolytics at the cortex. So um, I think probably all of you are aware that one of the antihistamines, Atarax, is being used a lot for anxiety these days. And uh, it's an antihistamine, but it seems to have a lot of anxiolytic properties. And so that can be a, a nice uh, one that's maybe doing two for the price of one here. And then for your GI peripheral pathways, this is again your antidopaminergics and your 5-HD3 antagonists, um, that kind of thing. And we'll talk about, uh, and then we'll soon talk about what some representative medications are for those different categories. And that might be my next slide. We'll see here. So matching the medication to the mechanism. So your your dopamine antagonists. This includes some oldies but goodies. So haldol and droperidol. They are they are anti dopaminergic. Reglan, which is a, a, a promotilic pro pro. Homotilic, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> we get it. Medication uh, is a uh, has as uh, is a good example also of a D two antagonist, compazine and thorazine. So you can see uh, up there on this slide, I have three um, of the more more of the world of psychiatric medicine: haldol, thorazine, droperidol. These are are really where their effect seems to be is in that that uh, dopamine uh, receptor antagonism. The 5-HT3 antagonist, Zofran, of course, is the shining star there. And, uh, and then some of these other ones. Remeron uh, has some of that uh, benefit as well. I rarely use Kytrol or Emend. Um, I don't know if anybody else around the table or online uses those medications much. They're, they're, they're less available, but Zofran. Emend is now Dr. Levisor's favorite medication. Really? So oh, he, no he's kidding. using a lot of that. Emend is Dr. Levisor's favorite okay yeah. is dr levisor online yes he is on he's okay. on with us today well if you uh you probably have more experience with that one then if you have any uh things you'd like to say about it i'd love to hear it yeah well thank you um so i have been using it quite a bit and you know when i when i first used it it was uh because it's it doesn't prolong the qtc and so that was kind of how it was introduced uh, to me and okay. so i thought well this is a great option to for a ton of our patients that come in the inpatient setting they they're usually cancer patients and their electrolytes are off. So um, if they don't have a prolonged QTC, it's typically elevated. Um, what I tend to do is follow the same, um, I guess, protocol that, that I've seen for chemo-induced nausea. And that's typically combined with uh, steroids and it's combined with Zofran. But they'll give, and I don't necessarily always combine those two with it, but that's just how they do it in the studies. But it's uh, first day is about 125 milligrams, and then it's followed by two or three days of 80 milligram tabs. And I've never had anybody complain about the tabs. Um, they usually always get them down. Um, it is expensive, though. I had one patient where we could not seem to improve her nausea, and I think that Amend was the only drug that helped. And she was looking at taking it in the outpatient setting. I, for cyclic vomiting syndrome, I've seen protocols where it's like twice a week. Um, and so we had looked it up. It's about fifty dollars a pill, if not more. It can be up to a, a, more like a, closer to eighty dollars for for the, the larger milligram pill. Um, but I also, over time, I think when I think about amend, I also think about Zyprexa. Now that's QTC prolonging. It's very. It's I think it's it doesn't prolong it very much, but it's cheaper, and I've had pretty good success with that too. So those are two drugs that I I've been using quite a bit more. Okay. Well, thank yeah. you very much for your input on there. Jason, were you going to say something? Well, men is used a lot for uh, chemotherapy, like pre medication. Amen. Yeah, pre pre. Yeah, synergistic effects with a lot of the other meds, plus you get the loading yeah. follow up. It is expensive, but in the context of cancer therapeutics, it's $50 to the, you know. So, so, so yeah. Dr. I was just commenting, I, maybe you guys could hear them. Hopefully, oh, yeah, there is a microphone down there. So, okay, yeah. good. So, just talking about how it's used in, in the world of chemotherapy-induced nausea, 
as almost of a pre-treatment, did you say, Jason? Correct. It's yeah. very standard. You get a lot of pre-meds. Goal is to keep that curve down low, and it's got the follow-up. Now, Dr. Levisor, I you said one thing that was uh, that I wanted to just double check with you on. You mentioned using both EMEND and Zofran, and both of those are 5-HT3 antagonists, and I guess that caught me a little bit by surprise. Is there a... Uh, can you... Uh, you said, uh, so MEND is um, like an NK1 antagonist, and you said Zofran, which is... You know, 5-HT3. Yeah. So they have, and they have synergies to come back. Okay, they have yeah. synergies to come back. Okay. Well, thank you very much for both of you for your input on that one. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, two things uh, then to say on that, and, and uh, again, I don't want to wade too far into the QTC thing, but um, back when I was a younger man, uh, we were aware of QTC and, of course, Torsad de Poin, but I can't recall the same level of, I would say, attention to QTC prolongation as there has been over the last few years. It seems like I get a lot more notifications, hey, this, one, this drug is a QTC prolonger, and, of course, so many of the medications that we use do result in QTC prolongation. What I'm a little puzzled by is, has there actually been any particularly bad outcomes from QTC prolongation? We always think about Torsade de Poin, but in all of this discussion and the focusing on QTC prolongation, I have not heard any particular commensurate discussion about, by the way, we're seeing a lot of Torsade de Poin. So um, again, I would invite those at the table who are perhaps younger and better informed on some of this, are, is, are we paying too much attention to QTC prolongation? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and someone on the call here uh, a month or so ago, when we were talking about methadone, yeah, I posed that same question because yeah. I have the same level of skepticism. Yeah, but there were a couple that actually had seen okay. uh, issues uh, okay. with with uh, arrhythmias uh, secondary to QTC prolongation. Okay, um, so it exists. I I I would agree that I I'm confused by it, quite frankly, and I just work under the assumption that every drug will, will cause some element of QTC prolongation. Yeah. And so just to be just to be aware well, of that, to be cautious of that, to be careful with that. So perhaps, perhaps you know, and, and in that context, perhaps it is good to be able to say, okay, well, well we know at least some drugs that won't. Right. So in this case, uh, we have a fifty to eighty dollar per pill drug that won't, which is the amend. Um antihistamines, uh, so, so Benadryl, Fenergan, Anavert, Cyclozine, uh, Atarax. Uh, those are good examples of antihistamines. Your anticholinergics, this is that hyoscyamine, which is levsin, scopolamine. Those are those are examples of anticholinergics. Uh, promotility, there it is, promotility. I was looking for that before. Yeah. So Reglan uh, propulsin, which is a uh, an older medication. It is available, but there's uh, hoops to jump through for propulsin. So Reglan is really kind of the, the, the more common example of a promotility drug. And then looped into the uh, category of others, we'll put things like steroids, Ativan, and then Zyprexa was mentioned. And I would agree that Zyprexa, of, uh, as far as some of the newer uh, medications that are being explored for the treatment of nausea, vomiting, Zyprexa uh, seems to be kind of a shining uh, star there. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I did, uh, there we are, yep, good. Opioid induced, so some poppies for your enjoyment there. Uh, primarily hits the CTZ. So just to kind of remember that if you can. And where are we here? Consider opioid rotation. Sometimes uh, different opiates hit people differently. And uh, so it's appropriate to start to look at trying a different opiate if you can. And then think of using D2 antagonists for this. So if you've got opioid induced, Nausea, you can look more at the composines and the reglans, and then if you want to start looking at things like Haldol or Thorazine, uh, those would probably be secondary options for you. Chemotherapy-induced. Just moving a little slow here. Sorry about that. Primarily from the HT3 stimulating uh, pathways, the gut and peripheral pathways. Think, okay, okay. So think 5-HT3 antagonists, Zofran, Kytrol, Emend, and Remeron, and Emend has, a, looks like it's a, got some other different actions there to it. Okay, malignant bowel obstruction, we'll spend just a little bit of time on this one. So again, the, 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 the nausea sensation is primarily from stimulation of the chemoreceptor trigger zone, 
So again, think of D2 antagonists like your Reglan, Composine, and Haldol. There are other things that you might want to consider here. So especially for in the inpatient environment, uh, octreotide, which is a subcutaneously or can be intravenously given medication, but it can be given sub-Q, uh, is, a, is a medication that can be used uh, the the benefits here are that it tends to diminish secretions in the gut, and so that can be of a lot of benefit. I've heard of some hospices occasionally using octreotide. I would say that I have never done it in an outpatient setting. Um, theoretically, it could be done. Um, it's expensive, um, but it can be a very nice medication, especially, like I said, in the setting of the malignant bowel obstruction and especially on the inpatient side. Um, steroids can have a real benefit here because, again, they have that anti-inflammatory and hopefully re result in some reduced swelling of the gut, some reduced swelling of those, of those uh, colonic uh, tissues. And then don't forget to decompress. So um, that one we should talk just a little bit about. You can de decompress a few different ways. You can put an NG tube down somebody and that can be effective. It's, um, it's not necessarily a great long-term solution for your patient. So if you're looking at somebody who's got uh, an underlying cancer, which is that what we're talking about here, uh, they really don't go home on an NG tube, or at least not for very long. You're probably going to want to convert it over to some sort of a venting gastrostomy tube, or uh, sometimes uh, they will do more work with stents some of these days. So in the setting of uh, an obstruction due to, due to tumor, tumor burden, uh, sometimes uh, surgeons or GI docs are probably more often now, uh, probably interventional radiologists will place these uh, self-expanding metal stents in the gut, which can last for quite a while. The benefit is they can also uh, have some, I mean, patients can eat uh, when they have these stents in place, and that's important for people. So um, it tends to be a fairly benign thing, again, a somewhat expensive thing. So um, choosing your patients uh, for that is, is an important thing. But decompression in the setting of malignant bowel obstruction, I do think is something very important to pay attention to. I want to just kind of revisit the octreotide just for a moment. Yeah. Um, historically, it is very expensive. And, and I was looking into that uh, uh, some, you know, just not, not that long ago um, because someone, just, someone had asked me about it and I have seen the benefit of it. What I found was really kind of surprised me. There, there were the, the concentration that you use is what determines the price. I found concentrations of octreotide that ran into the tens of thousands of dollars. I found other concentrations that ran into the tens of dollars. Really? Yeah. And so we we found uh, just you find the right concentration, pick your dose, and you can do those with intermittent sub Q at home, and it, and it can work really really well. Yeah. So I think that we have a tendency to sort of marginalize it yeah. because of the historical cost issues. Right. That, that really in, in the early days of this, I mean, 20 years ago, it was it was it was not it was untouchable. Yeah. It was so expensive. Yeah. Uh, but there have been uh, other uh, formulations that have hit the market in, in more recent years that uh, are very very reasonable. Well, that's great to know. Yeah. So just uh, I you know it and we've done it in hospice patients uh, a number of times now because of okay. that. So uh, I'm I'm curious. So, so Dr. Mulder is saying that they've they've actually been able to do it. Uh, because of some some uh, improvement in cost with the with the different concentrations, others are around the table are participating online. Anybody else with some experience of using octreotide in the outpatient, uh, either hospice or even palliative care setting? Okay, well, something to to maybe start to look at, it. and maybe uh, next year when I do this, uh, if I do this lecture again next year, I'll have uh, I'll try to do a little in, uh, more research on that and see see what we actually can come up with there, because I would like to put that in my toolbox. Hey, Ted, I can just briefly mention, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, we did some research into that as well. Um, I think it's commonly, it's still in the fast facts about octreotide, but just some of the research shows there's still, you know, potential QT prolonging, a lot of drug interactions, adjustments needed for hepatic or renal impairment. Um, just a lot of other things to consider, but also at one point we were looking into as a team, the, the, the depot, depot injection, um, it's very expensive, that particular form ranging from $3,000 to $7,000. Uh, and, and I think what we lo learned from that reviewing of literature is it takes a long time to reach steady state. So many, many of our patients with malignant bowel obstruction have days to weeks to live typically. Right. Um, and so, 
spending that amount of money is and then not having the results of that it's not worth the cost so we no longer have looked into that particular way yeah. because that we knew yeah but this yeah it was great to know yeah i think there's the different concentrations like the 50 mics per ml was uh per ml was four dollars and 80 cents yeah um, yeah so I'm, I'm looking at a price right now of uh, 35 dollars for 10 mls of uh of that uh, concentration dr Mulder just pulled this on up so and, and the price rapidly goes up as the concentration gets more concentrated but interesting and so okay well thank you thank you gretchen for your gretchen, input on that too very much appreciate that this is uh mike dozman uh if you guys can hear me hi mike yeah. so i do have one patient that i have on sub q octreotide in my palliative clinic at metro um young guy with uh gastric cancer severe gastric outlet obstruction on tpn yeah. um and I've had him on sub q octreotide for probably three or four months um, right now. It's something that I had to have oncology order uh, for insurance to cover and something that they administer um, in their infusion clinic. But it's been working very well for him. Um, you know, couldn't control his nausea any other way. And now, yeah, he gets it every four weeks. And, uh, yeah, it's working really well. Well, thank you, Mike. Appreciate hearing about that, too. That's great to hear. So we'll move on now to motion-induced uh, nausea. And so the picture of the inner ear there, uh, primarily for stimulation of that vestibular system. Think of using your antimuscarinic, so scopolamine and, and levson, or uh, you can also use antihistamine. So um, antivert, you know, anti-vertigo, has just kind of been the, the prototypical uh, drug to use for motion-induced nausea. I don't, I'm not aware of any studies that say antivert is any better than any other antihistamine, but that certainly seems to be the marketing for it. And theoretically, it's a little less sedating than things like Benadryl. Um, but I have wondered about, well, why couldn't we just use Atarax as well in this situation? We probably could. Fenergan probably has some of its benefit here as an antihistamine. In fact, uh, Fenergan, uh, we used to talk about one of the main benefits of using Fenergan in our patients was they went to sleep. And at least then they could, they could be more comfortable because they were asleep. Uh, so uh, that's uh, th those are kind of typical things there. Uh, increased ICP, we've touched on that a little bit before, but certainly when there is increased pressure in the brain, nausea, vomiting. So this is why we one of the things that we talk about when we have patients with head injuries, for those who have um, experience with kids or, or in emergency room settings, uh, as you want to know, are they having vomiting? Because that can be a sign of uh, the fact that there's something more going on in the brain, like some bleeding. This is a direct stimulator of the vomiting center of the brain. It does not go through, through the CTZ. It hits the medulla uh, vomiting center directly. And uh, your best things to do are going to be act to decrease the pressure. So steroids are going to be a very important uh, part of your toolbox in this setting. Um, and you can see up on the, on the picture, there's also, um, well, antihistamines, but I'm want to go back here super, super sorry i don't know how to go back now well uh there was a, there was a picture there of a burr hole so sometimes your neurosurgeons will actually take a drill and drill a hole into the brain to allow some for some pressure discrepancies or pressure release i should say um now we'll come to dosing and of course go hard or go home by the time uh, palliative care gets involved with our patients they've usually already been on something and almost always it's been on on intermittent zofran uh, so when we come to involve other patients, uh, it's time to start to look uh, for other things and, and to look more at robust dosages. So um, the point is here, use appropriate doses and, and consider scheduling them around the clock. Again, depending on, on your situation with these patients, if they've already been using you know, various PRN medications, and again, I'll pick on Zofran or Compazine, kind of those seem to be quite typical. And they're being used PRN, and the patient will say, well, sometimes it works, but I'm not sure if it's really working or it's given here. And so uh, to start to use appropriate doses, but to consider scheduling them around the clock can be an effective strategy. So we'll come back to our case study with our elderly lady with the ovarian cancer who wanted to keep eating. So we put her on Reglan uh, to help try to get some, she had that partial small bowel obstruction, and I, I would emphasize I wouldn't use Reglan in the setting of a complete bowel obstruction, but in this case, uh, she had had some distance from her partial bowel obstruction, and we figured we could uh, use a promotility agent on her, so we chose Reglan. 
we chose Zofran and then we use a pro, uh, proton pump inhibitor and we did schedule those things around the clock. And initially she seemed to respond pretty well, but then things got worse. And again, I'm gonna come back to the fact that she was continuing to eat, okay? This was one of her important things. Wasn't having vomiting, um, but, uh, and then she was, uh, she was, I recall she was just continually kind of confused between is it nausea, is it heartburn, and, uh, and maybe that's not so unusual. So we added Phenergan and we added an H2 blocker, but we really didn't have much improvement. So we've gotten pretty aggressive here at this point. Reglan, Zofran, H2 blocker, Fener um, uh, Phenergan, and, uh, and not doing what we wanted it to do. So. We'll now come to intractable vomiting. So what do you do when the things you ordinarily do aren't working? And now we can look at polydrug regimens and routes of delivery. So general guidelines in general recommend not using more than one drug from each class. In general, can start, consider start to add some of the less traditional medications. And this is where Decadron, Ativan, Zyprexa uh, belong in, in that category. Consider alternate routes, consider things like topical, rectal, sub-Q, rather than just continuing to rely on oral tablets when a patient's nauseated, it can be challenging. And then as always, be alert for drug interactions. Uh, John, can you help me go back here? Maybe I, I think I might have missed one. Okay, maybe not. Okay, so we can talk about continuous infusions. Back a long time ago, when I was part of this fellowship, um, I started to learn for the first time about drug infusions given for nausea. I had had no prior experience with that in my prior practice in any way, in any form. Um, I think uh, it's become much more common knowledge now, but I think that's still mainly in the palliative care world. I think outside the palliative care world, uh, these continuous infusions still are, are I think, a, a mystery for people but they can have the potential to be very, very meaningful for, for people. They have uh, the potential to provide very quick and effective relief for tractable nausea, and they can be, in fact, transitioned over to an oral regimen. And so we're talking about a bad drip, which consists of a combination of Benadryl, Ativan, and Decadron. And we can talk a little bit about RBD drips, Reglan, Benadryl, and Decadron. These are typically initiated in an inpatient setting. Uh, well, I'm sorry, but maybe not quite. In a palliative care world, they're initiated in a inpatient setting typically. Um, of course, in the hospice world, they can be done at home or uh, in some facilities. Uh, these are subcutaneous drips. Um, with, and I've included the recipes here for, for those of you who would like to have those. And then, then the various, uh, the, the, the window for the rate uh, is included there on that slide as well. Can you just make a comment about the drips? The um, I was first introduced to them 25 years ago, and you know for me it was revolutionary in terms of how effective they were and and uh, you know people responded well to them. I would say over the years uh, many have adopted them simply because they work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, many around the table, many on the calls have have seen it work. Also, I would say that if you go to uh, to palliative conferences especially those that are becoming more scientifically oriented and looking at evidence basis. Um, you can't find a lot of evidence for why this drip should work mm -hmm. in deference to giving intermittent IV, sub-Q pushes, or oral. Um, and because of that lack of evidence, and I'm using air quotes, and I'm using air quotes, um, people shy away from it. Uh, my take on this has always been, and I still remember sitting in front of the PNT committee at one of the hospital systems uh, in which I was challenged by the anesthesiologist who, who really correctly said, well, you don't know how this works. And so I had, a, com I had a, a bit of a conversation with him about how his anesthetic agents work mm. and the fact that some of them, we don't necessarily understand the exact mechanism, but we know it puts people to sleep, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I finally told him, said, you know, these are tend to be last resort types of interventions. And the, uh, the downside is very, very small. And the, the risks of these are almost non-existent because of the, the dose that people are being exposed to. 
And what I what I finally said to him, I said, you know, uh, when you are lying in that hospital bed and you are chronically nauseated or puking your guts out, you're going to want this on the formulary when nothing else has worked. Yeah. Yeah. And so he voted to have it allowed on the formulary. So um, for that reason. And so I, I would I, I readily admit that uh, uh, that that we don't have a strong evidence basis for that. We do have an evidence base for its safety mm -hmm. uh, for, for those combination drips. There's there's literature on that. Uh, but in terms of uh, double blind placebo controlled studies, you know, comparing it with other forms of anti nausea. Mm -hmm. No, we don't have that. But I, I still am, am, a, am, am a big advocate. So I'll get off the soapbox. Well, I think it's a, it's a good point. So, so these are these are combination uh, infusions that uh, can be safe. Uh, I think for many of us who've used them, our personal experience has been they can be very effective. Uh, and there's there's lots of things that go into your own personal experience, of course. And then the other thing is, I will also say when John says that these are kind of a last resort, I would say that that's true as well. And I've noticed that I seem to be using less of them over the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, doing intermittent dosings, I think, can be helpful. And and uh, I think previously I'm going to forget the gentleman's name um, did his uh, fellowship at Ohio State University. Uh, Robert Johnson. Rob Bob Johnson had yeah. done some different studies on this, and I think Bob's Bob's uh, takeaway was that steroids are maybe the most important part of of this uh, that we do. Uh, so I tend to use a lot of steroids. Jason, I think you were going to say something. I'm going to kind of dovetail on what John was talking about. Uh, I for years have used. Um, a Zofran drip, which is really, oh. you know, eight milligrams TID, that's 24 milligrams. Yeah. Um, the, the caveat I want to get back to is thinking about the different uh, trigger zones and whatnot, especially the cortex. And I have no doubt there's a lot of placebo effect here. You put 24 milligrams of Zofran in a liter bag, you hang that, you run it over 24 hours. Some of the placebo effect, it's IV rather than oral, yeah. must be better. Yeah. Um, you're getting a little bit of rehydration. Yep. And a lot of this is, I think, too, in how we manage expectations amongst our patients. So let's not forget the um, conscious you know, um, awareness of our nausea and how then that starts to feed into this you know, vicious cycle. And how I uh, usually will um, advise the patient is not, you know, in an hour or two, are you better? Is it gone? But in about an hour or two, you should start to feel that we're at least starting to turn the corner using very purposefully um, ambiguous language, but it's it, we're, we're getting a general, because then if they can feel one degree of improvement, ah, it must be working. And now the conscious part of that loop is starting to be impacted. I think that's a very good observation is how we, how we sell this medication in some ways, which Sounds sounds more manipulative than I mean it to, but how our own experience and our own um, uh, our own setting of expectations for patients, and I think even our own lack of stress and calming part of this being able to say, I think I'm going to be able to help you, yeah, uh, is is a huge part of how we impact patients both with pain and and other symptom management. We have time at the end, I think, too, if we've had our own experiences with this. Uh, I've had um, post uh, anesthesia nausea twice and it was gut awful and the first time i was able to keep like a half an ounce of ginger ale and a singular saltine down mm -hmm. i've turned the corner yeah. and it was like off yeah. you know, but once we have that experience i said i think it gives us a lot more empathy right and the ability to again keep it on the positive line it's not manipulation if it's intended with you know i agree with good intention i agree can i ask you a quick question please sure i missed this but are these pre-mixed so are you wire? Are you line? You know, using three lines? No, no, no. They're mixed. They're pre mixed. Yes. Okay. So, 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 uh, so. For instance, when I went to my current organization, we we approached the hospital and said, "Look, I, I would like to be able to do this." And they're like, "Well, we've never done this before." So, I was able to reach out to John, get the recipe, then talk to the pharmacy. The pharmacy now has the recipe. They can put this all together. Comes up in a bag. Now, you've had previous experience where it was literally, they said, we are not going to label this thing a bad drip. because You don't want anything bad. <laughs> that's a, that's a that's poor it. optics. Uh, <laughs> so they call it ABD drip. Yeah. Or dab. Yeah, or dab. Or dab. Or however, however you want to call it. Arrange the letters uh, is fine. Uh, using it on an outpatient. So we typically, for our patients, use the St. Mary's uh, pharmacy to put that together. And again, they have the recipes all set. So I don't have to give them the recipe anymore. I can just say, here's what I want to do. And then I can figure out the rate. 
So, John, this is probably irrelevant, but would they have been more accepting if it was not pre-mixed? So maybe no, no, they no. didn't mind it being pre-mixed. So uh, they were really worried about the Ativan, I think, as as you recall that telling that story. Yeah, they they, they were. There was there was a case in which uh, someone had started received a drip and uh, and died uh, overnight, and they were very very concerned. Um, but when they looked at the dose of the Ativan, plus they they analyzed what was in the bag and realized that the type of plastic that they were using was wrong, and that the and, and that actually adhered the Ativan. So none of the Ativan was actually in the mix. And the patient actually bled out. He had to be sanguinated. So it had nothing, nothing to do with the drug. But yeah, so the, so the Ativan is, is a concern for some. And I'm aware that we are actually nearly out of time. I'm so sorry about that, guys. Uh, alternative therapies, we'll just kind of get this to acupuncture, acupressure, Korean hand therapy, and aromatherapy. Uh, just because I have them at the end of the lecture does not mean that I, I undervalue or that I don't value these. They I probably do undervalue them. I don't use them nearly as often as I sometimes think I should, but these can be very effective things. That aromatherapy is such an easy one to do. So back to one of my early slides, ginger and mint, um, very easy for people to get a little mint uh, going one way or another. And uh, that can have a nice effect in, in the same way that having brushing your teeth can have a nice effect. And it's Sometimes just the absence of bacon can be aromatic. Absence of bacon, I have high, highly recommend. Um, acupuncture, I'm, uh, again, this, uh, this took a little longer, my apologies. I do want to get to, oh, I don't want to talk about this. Let's see. I don't want to talk about this either. We do want to talk about this just for a second. And I guess the take-home point I would say before I close up the lecture would be to just say this, that uh, right now probably the safest thing I can say about marijuana is that there is a lack yet of good, clear, evidence-based um, understanding of what it can do for us. Um, I would land in the place of, for the most part, it's relatively benign. When I do have patients who express any interest in trying it, my usual recommendation is, well, first of all, if you've ever used it before and had good experience, that's a good, a good sign. If you've never used it before and you're 84 years old, then I start to get a little bit more skeptical. But for patients who do decide they're going to want to use it, I'm usually recommending that they go to a dispensary. Um, and so that they can have consistency. I, I, I'm going to recommend that they get the same plant, that they get the same formulation, whether you're using a gummy or a pretzel or something like that, um, so that they can really have a good sense of, is this a, a consistent delivery of the medic of the drug so that they can understand, is it helping them or not? And I usually also want to know about it so I can incorporate that understanding into whatever happens down the road in terms of side effects or, or, or that kind of a thing. But I do think it has some potential role for us, it's just not clear exactly what, and maybe there will be more clarity coming. So let's see, we'll come here to the um, thoughts on marijuana. Good search, I've already talked about that. Patient did well on the bad drip, by the way, that, uh, that lady. Um, yeah, my lady with ovarian cancer, we put her on that bad drip. Um, continued on her H2 blocker and the proton pump inhibitor. Um, we gave her a GI cocktail once in a while, and and then this last part is important too. We ended up uh, at some point really being able to talk to her about her prognosis and have her stop doing the tube feedings, and that was an important part of her of her uh, improvement as well. And she passed away comfortably. So some random thoughts here: Decadron is terrific. Haldol and Zyprexa too. Don't forget about decompression. Combination drugs can be helpful. Good dosing. Identify, do a good assessment, choose a mechanism based on what you think, choose a medication based on what you think might be going on, dose appropriately on a scheduled basis, consider multi-drug regimens, infusions, less traditional medications. Apologize for the rush there at the end, but thanks everybody for your you know, patience. I got one one quick thing I want to just do here. I'm going to stop sharing here. Uh, stop share. Okay. So if if you all can um, uh, look at that, he, he he passed over a uh, a screen talking about the acupressure, and this is just a little technique that I've used um, uh, at the bedside in response to the effectiveness of acupressure. And you've probably seen C bands and other sorts of devices in the in the um, in, in the pharmacy to help with seasickness and such. And it uh, and 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 there's there's a rational. Uh, justification for its use. The, the the key to it is having it at the right spot, 
And uh, so the, the, the correct spot is if you look at the two flexor tendons. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's not it. Oh, okay, well, you come over here then. I guess I, I would have to do the screen here. Okay. Uh, so the, 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 you've got these flexor tendons in your wrist. And if you, and if you go between those two flexor tendons, three finger breadths from the distal radial crease there, or wrist crease, whatever they call that one. So three down from that. And that is the spot where that bead needs to go. Now, the, the, the key uh, for a lot of times when, when, when people are putting those bands on, they'll put it right in the middle of the wrist, which misses the point. Or when people are uh, at the bedside, they're, they're aiming more toward the pulse area, which is also misses the point. So what I have done, uh, people who are nauseated at the bedside, so I will, I'll, I'll take that, I will find that very quickly, uh, that point between the, the, the two uh, flexor tendons, and just gently put my finger on there while I'm talking to the patient, okay? And, and then within, within a few moments, as you're talking to them about what you're going to do, you're reassuring them, you're doing what your good bedside manner stuff is going to be doing, um, by the time you leave, their nausea is gone, and they think that you're you're a great doc, and uh, you know they're attributing it to your wonderful bedside manner, which in fact you've just been accessing this this uh, this acupressure point. Um, but it can be very very effective. I've done that with kids who are you know sitting in the back seat of the car and start you know acting like they're sick. I see the little hand shoot forward, and I just grab it, put a little pressure on that. Uh, that's where the heart sicks. Um, acupressure point. And uh, it can be a quick and easy and obviously cheap way of, of doing that. And so we've used seat bands in a lot of different uh, environments, but uh, you can do it at the bedside very, very simply uh, just by making sure you're, you're, and you don't have to press hard, just, just, uh, just a gentle pressure on. It. So anyway. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Good All stuff. Right. So as we finish up, uh, just, I'll just quickly ask anybody with any questions or observations or comments to make before we finish, uh, before we finish this presentation. Um, hey, this is Ken Hansen. Can you hear me okay? Hey, Ken. Um, I was going to give a comment, just an observation based on anecdotal experience. This is more really <clears throat> for motion sickness. Um, not sure it has a lot to do with our patients, but it might overlap for other types of nausea. You know, with my being affiliated with the military, <clears throat> I've had the opportunity to get um, motion sick multiple times <laughs> when I was in the Navy or flying with the Air National Guard. And I've found the distraction works very well. Um, when I was able to kind of engage, um, like I had one mission where I was flying, I was back seating in a F-16 and the pilot walked me through the dogfight the whole time. And I realized that I really wasn't that nauseated because I was able to concentrate on what was going on instead of sitting there and focusing on the nausea. You know, analogy might be like uh, neuropathic pain, right? You know, they can distract themselves during the day until they lay down to sleep at night and then it comes back. Um, I've seen examples also on, you know, out on boats where people, if you give them control of the boat and they're able to drive it, same with cars. I don't have the uh, physiology behind that. I don't understand it. But if somebody is able to drive the vehicle, they don't get sick. As soon as they sit, right, um, they start getting nauseated. So it's one of these things that's just peculiar, but uh, I thought I'd mention that. Great observation, Ken. I think it applies very appropriately here and, of course, in, in a lot of other symptom management issues as well. Thank you. Anybody else with anything? Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody.